Hello Vincasters and welcome back to another episode of the Vincast. My name is James Guestbrook, also known as the Intrepid Wino and uh, we're back again. Uh, it's really coming to the end of winter now so not far away. Spring, starting to warm up, time to start drinking more rosés and white wines, maybe even bubbles. Um, spring racing carnival, not far away, really exciting. Um, Make sure you're drinking lots of different stuff. You don't have to drink champagne. You don't have to drink Method Traditionnel. You, you know, Prosecco is a great option. Uh, Cava. Uh, there's lots of really exciting stuff. Even, you know, some Lambrusco maybe. Um, there's lots of lovely bubbles you could be drinking um, as we head into spring. And then, of course, summer. Um, there's been some funny things going on uh, here in Australia. It's now sort of um, awards season for a lot of the, the restaurants and bars, wine lists, um, restaurateurs, there's lots of stuff going on. It's been a, a pretty interesting couple of weeks, lots of discussion about um, what's happening in terms of wine lists in Australia. Uh, it's been some contentious things said possibly. Um, there seems to be a little bit of division between possibly um, some of the younger people working in the wine industry and in hospitality and some of the more established people who um, possibly might be not as connected to what's happening um, you know, on the fringes in terms of the dynamic side of, of, of wine. Uh, and uh, I'm really keen to kind of hear what people's thoughts are. How, the, how do you feel about um, wine lists in Australia, whether it's restaurants, whether it's wine bars, um, you know, do, are, are your needs being met or do people um, want to go into places and be, I don't know, challenged or introduced to new things? I'm, I'm really interested to find out what people um, want, you know, are looking for. So please do um, hit me up on Twitter at Intrepid Wino or at The Vincast. Um, jump onto um, my Facebook uh, my blog, whatever. Um, I, I really want to hear from people and, and hear what people think about um, the state of wine lists in Australia. But in any case, um, I have uh, invited someone on today who uh, is very much on that kind of cutting edge fringe um, side of things, uh, working both as a restaurateur, wine bar um, uh, owner, and also as a um, uh, an importer himself, uh, and his name is Giorgio Di Maria. Uh, he is actually uh, from Italy, uh, my, I think my second guest from Italy now. Um, and he is behind such um, cult Sydney institutions as Vini and 121BC. And uh, I've brought him on to talk a little bit about himself and, and the exciting things he's doing. So thank you for joining me today, Giorgio. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Giorgio. Tell me, where, where did it all begin in terms of wine for you? What was the first interaction with wine that led you on this path? Uh, well, um, yeah, if I tell you that I was drinking wine in my water when I was eight, uh, people would get very... Uh... <laughs> I don't think so. I think people would sort of maybe expect that from, from Italians. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know, people yeah. are like, they don't, they're drinking wine from a... a from a, a, from the a baby bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, but, you know, it's, I, I think uh, in regards to that, um, I think it's fantastic to educate people to drink alcohol because, uh, yes, alcohol, as we all know, as a, you know, um, it's because it contains alcohol, doesn't have great effect on, you know, on your organs, as people say, but in the other end, um, it's it's about how you approach uh, wine and eventually spirits as well, and um, so it's about drinking with uh, culture and with moderation, um, and uh, to be able to be guided, you know, by your parents when you're day young, in appreciation of wine or even just a appreciation of drinking some wine with your food because you know my parents were and so on, yeah, so there was not. A great appreciation of great wine, mm. but uh, there was this um, um, very common thing in Italy of drinking with your meal. Yeah, but wine, um, wine is just part of, of life. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's just part of yeah. the meal and it's, you know, yeah, the same and, way the food is. And it does have, a, a, in terms of uh, digestive properties, is, is, uh, it's extremely important. So, um, yeah, so I, I believe that's a great thing to do. And um, yeah, and sometimes I think. Uh, 
um, you know, prohibition or anyway, looking at alcohol like a, you know, a bad beast and no education, but only prohibition is not the right way to approach it. Obviously, that's that's <laughs> a really big topic, certainly in Australia, um, alcohol laws and taxes and stuff like that is a... Uh, you know, a, a grey area. They'll probably come back from another episode and talk all about that. But um, <laughs> well, so so wine was part of your life from when you were very young. At what at what point? What was there something that happened, or um, you know, you realised, oh, this is something that I'd like to do as far as a a career. You know, you were passionate about it and you wanted to kind of follow that path. Yeah, well, it it actually began in a different way. So it's um, I was always working in restaurants to pay my study, my university. What were you uh, studying? I studied agriculture. So, agriculture. Yeah, so I got a five five years degree in uh, agriculture. And uh, where did you study that? Uh, in uh, Torino, which is uh, Torino. in the north of Italy. Uh huh. Or Turin. For Turin. Yeah. For Torino. Not yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you from that area? Or which, which part of Italy are you from? I'm from um, about uh, 30k. I'm actually born in Torino, mm -hmm. and I moved when I was uh, 13, uh, 30k away from Torino oh, towards the mountains. Okay. So not in a wine region, but uh, just just at the feet of the mountains, as the name of my region suggests, mm -hmm. Piemonte. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so yeah, just uh, you know, beautiful view from my room. Of, Mont Viso Mountains, which is the mountain of uh, that you see in Paramount. Oh right, okay. Yes. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so you were working in restaurants as you were studying agriculture. Did, did you um, focus on any particular area in agriculture? Like, did you? Yeah, were, more, were you studying a bit about yeah, more vines, for, forest environment. Okay. So not much to do with uh, with actually viticulture. Sure. Uh, but more to do with uh, more cheese, actually. It's my cheese. background, yes. There's some, obviously, there's some yeah. great yeah, cheeses. Yeah. So where's a big cheese festival in, in Bra? Yeah, in Bra, yeah. That's in yeah, Piemonte, isn't it? Every two years, yeah. Yeah. So the name is Cheese. Right. A friend yeah. of mine actually went to it, I think, last year and said it was just phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic because you... It's the same vibe and the same way of approaching things um you know it's a good part of the food you know uh this making amazing products um uh, available for everyone and um all together in one place with that sense of uh, feast uh and festival rather than too serious um so yeah, but, but also in, in terms of the agricultural side of things and obviously cheese is, yeah. is, is no different to wine in the sense that it's coming from a particular place. There is a connection with a, a certain place. Yeah, absolutely. My, my, my thesis, which uh, I, I wrote, you know, I was, um, I worked on for four years. Uh, so pretty much uh, I, I started at my second year of university was um, studying all the pastures, so all the different herbs on the mountains. Wow, okay. For a summer production. Yeah. F f uh, studying that cows, that breed of cows that they were using there, and and uh, analyzing the milk, analyzing the, the cheeses that come from the milk from the different pasture. Mm -hmm. and, um, and all this work was uh, directed uh, to obtain the DOP. Right. Uh, so the denominazione di origine protetta. Yeah. So protected yeah, area which of, is, den of denomination. That's it. Which is an appellation, you know, exactly like wine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the aim of that is to say, okay, this is the area in which you can produce that cheese or yes. that wine. Yes. And uh, and you know that there is you you know you can only produce a certain amount. Yes. And so you limiting and you protecting that product because. Uh, it cannot be replicated somewhere else. Um, plus, uh, in addition to that, uh, generally this type of project uh, brings everyone who's gonna sort of be part of this um, uh, appellation to make uh, better products, you sure. know, and moving towards quality. And you kind of took that, the, the study, the interest in that uh, agriculture and, and sense of place a little bit into the work you were doing like in restaurants and yeah, with, with the food and with the wine yeah yeah absolutely so you know while i was doing all of that i was i was studying i was apologies i was working uh, pretty much every weekend yeah. and um in several restaurants in torino and other places uh, i worked um quite a bit 
with my brother who owns a restaurant. He's okay. a chef. Oh wow! And uh, he now works in South Korea. He's got his own place in really uh, Seoul. Yeah. It's an Italian restaurant? Italian restaurant, yeah. Oh, I wish I'd known, I would have gone. <laughs> okay, cool. And then when you finished the degree, did you kind of, did you pursue a bit of a career in agriculture? Yes, I did. So I actually worked for the university for, um, for another year. And, uh, Teaching or as an academic? Uh, no, as an, uh, so I basically follow up the project about my thesis. So I was uh, basically following up uh, other people that were um, bringing further um, my thesis, yep. basically. So yep. I, was a, I was a tutor of other students, um, but following my own project. And I'm sort of applying it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. So, you know, at that stage, though, um, yeah, I was, I was, in, in, I was incredibly interesting, interested in wine, but I didn't know much about what was out there. So how did you um, how did you feel that you needed to discover it? What did were you encouraged to to kind of oh, look? I uh, learn you more? know I probably have to you know at some stage I decided that um, that wasn't what I really want to do, and um, I thought I always regret not to be able to um, speak languages uh, apart for a little bit of French. And uh, I, I decided to to move to to Ireland uh, to to learn English because mm. uh, that's what I wanted to do, and um, and obviously working in hospitality is just a you know a great opportunity. You know, yeah. everywhere you are, you can find a job. Sure. So that was my aim at that time, and so I went through this phase of uh, working in Ireland for. Um, uh, I went to this first phase in which I wasn't speaking much English, so I was working for a quite big, not very interesting uh, restaurant. Um, and then I moved to a Mission Star restaurant in Dublin, and I went through the phase of uh, you know serving and drinking um, a lot of uh, premium wine, especially from France. Yes. So, um, you know, it was a bit of was a bit of a gold age at the time, you know, uh, <laughs> it was normal for me opening, you know, uh, Chateau Lafitte, uh, Cheval Blanc, uh, pretty sure. much every week. Mm -hmm. So there was people that were spending a lot of money on this stuff. Yeah. So I got to know all these uh, um, wine symbols, you know, like these all these... Um, um, Wine institutions, you know, with all these wine. Um, this is, this wine. is obviously after Ireland became part of the European Union. Uh, that was already after Ireland. Yeah, part so, of the so that probably would have contributed to pretty nice prices as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, th that stuff is very pricey anyway. But, yeah, uh, of course. Well, <laughs> yeah, but we were talking Austra about Austra uh, Australia comparatively. Yeah, is, it's yeah, another, absolutely. Yeah, it's another completely more. different league. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, but yeah, it's um, it was a great experience for me, so I don't regret anything about that, and um, it, it gave me a, an amazing background, an amazing uh, basement for what happened after that. Uh, so uh, what happened after that? So what happened after that? Um, as I said before, my my original aim was to travel a bit and learn a few languages and. Yeah. Um, having some fun um, and um, I moved to Japan really yeah so actually the, the real story is that I was living in Ireland and uh, I was about to um, to get uh, 30 and um, uh, as you know your last chance to get the visa like as a working holiday visa is when you're 30 mm -hmm. so I applied yeah, for I, my did, visa. I did mine when I was 29 <laughs> So I applied just before my birthday, and um, and then you have one one year time to to get here, and and then your your visa starts. It starts, yeah. Yeah. So then I just thought would be would it be cool to to spend a year somewhere in between, you know, Italy or Europe and Australia. Mm -hmm. So I contacted a friend, um, and um, I got. Um, a job in Japan in a restaurant in Tokyo wow. and I worked there for about 10 months there wasn't an issue about you I'm assuming you didn't speak any Japanese not Japanese at all but uh, there wasn't the, an the, issue there wasn't an issue because uh, the 
the people I was working for, uh, they were all Japanese, but yeah. they were all talking Italian. They were all speaking Italian. Okay. And uh, and then um, every night uh, they would have teach me things like uh, the bathroom is that way. Would mm-hmm. you like still a sparkling water, mm-hmm. or would you like white wine or mm-hmm. red wine? So Can you still remember I, much? I remember a little bit, but uh, I wouldn't go there. Yeah. <laughs> But so so in terms of like understanding the customers, that kind of thing, interacting, that was all fine. Yeah, that was all good. I mean, I wasn't. What was the? What I was wasn't the dealing. I wasn't dealing directly with the customers until the very end, and even then, like you said, I you didn't were like have a, the language like to explain the wine. Yeah, so I, it's very small restaurant. We're talking about twenty five seats, oh, but uh, okay. you know that that restaurant uh, opened pretty much about the same time I moved there, right, and. Uh, yeah, in less than six months, uh, was awarded as the best Italian restaurant in Japan. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Was, Where, really was, good. was the chef Italian or was he Japanese? Uh, Japanese. Okay. Yeah. Well, you often find with these restaurants um, in Tokyo and you know, everywhere in Japan, uh, there, is a, there is some really good rest, Italian restaurant in Osaka as well, uh, in Kyoto, but Osaka and in Tokyo particularly. Um you know, it was uh, it was quite common that you had the best Italian food in uh, in uh, in Japanese owned restaurants, mm. and it's, it's the same for um, uh, French wine, French French restaurant too. So uh, just like, yeah, the, the approach is great. The Japanese approach is fantastic because they spend time, they learn, they are very humble, and uh, but they're also very meticulous. They're very meticulous. So you know, I don't really believe that uh, they copy. Uh, what I really like about uh, Japanese people is that they pay an incredible attention. They study food like it was science, like mm-hmm. it was uh, medicine, mm-hmm. and uh, like engineering almost. Like engineering, and they do then uh, reinterpret it. So um, the cuisine that we had there was uh, was uh, absolutely incredible, and but you would have hit things that uh, you probably wouldn't eat in Italy sure. because. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, you know, you can in Japan you can eat bear, and uh, so they were cooking this beautiful dish with, which was bear, bear fillet with bear heart wow. and uh, with bear broth, and that's that's very Japanese to sort of have bear. bear Where was yeah. the bear? Where was the bear from? Uh, probably from Hokkaido. Right. Okay. Yeah. Up in the north. Yeah, up in the north, but. Really delicious. It tastes a little bit like um, it's got the sweetness of a horse. Well, I, I had a horse. Yeah. Like I, when I was in Japan, I had raw horse. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a and common thing like around. There's, yeah, there's horse. You get horse in different regions of Italy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, horse meat is actually very good for you. Yeah, uh, it's got a lot of iron content. Mm. But um, really delicious food. You know, each each plate, especially. Uh, Meat and fish would have the different part of the animal cooked in different way, wow. which is very Japanese. Yeah. But at the same time, the way of cooking these dishes was Italian, so never more than two or three ingredients. Okay. Just cooked to perfection. Um, so reinterpreted using using local ingredients and uh, where possible and where better, mm. and using obviously. Amazing olive oil coming from Italy, sure. wine coming from Italy, of course, uh, and you know cheeses coming from Italy. So all the stuff that is not possible uh, to 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 replicate because they are not the conditions to yeah. replicate. Yeah, uh, is important. But anything else like a tomato, there is I don't know how many thousand of variety of tomato in in Japan that are fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, as you said, they're very meticulous, but uh, they also very specialized. You know, you, you, I remember seeing all the magazine that the chef was getting to the post, and you know, there was a magazine about there was a magazine just about uh, uh, Italian pasta. So like uh, a I magazine, to, a magazine about... in Japanese Whoa. about uh, it, Italian pasta. So for issue I don't know what they're gonna write after twenty years. I don't I have no idea. But uh, it's like uh, so. 
you know you go there and say ah yeah can you you know uh, if you if you joke and say can you make fresh pasta you know they not just tell you uh, yes but they tell you you know which area of Italy you're talking about you know wow. and you know and maybe they have recipe that are changing from you know 50 meters away uh, from place to place yeah. and they they you know extremely knowledgeable about stuff that uh, even Italian chefs have forgotten about or haven't studied yeah so not not just because I'm Italian or a chef is Italian the food is necessarily good you know yeah. uh, it's about how much effort and passion you put into things attention to detail without yeah, yeah. so I, like that, I, I I guess that's kind of what I like about Japanese well particularly Japanese cuisine is that they're it's attention to detail and it's meticulous and quality is very high but they're also very humble about it yeah and so it is still there's this amazing balance between simplicity and elegance as well yeah um and and clearly that's sort of being expressed in so it's so it's like Italian food but with a Japanese flair to it yeah in a way you know like it's it was it was very Italian because, you know, there was some dishes that were, um, you know, recipe the ex- extremely territorial, mm-hmm. so, and, and um, unique and based on research. Mm-hmm. So we, we had also something that is quite common now in, um, in Italian restaurant, which is maybe the, the regional dinner. So a dinner all about one region of sure. Italy. So they had, they had uh, the choice there to go a la carte, so having all these dishes elaborated in an Italian way, yeah. but in a slightly different way, mm-hmm. or going with the original uh, menu. Mm. So you could choose to to do one way or the other. But when I'm saying creative, I'm not talking about uh, fine dining. So it was obviously a top-end restaurant, but... Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't get a, a plate with the form and uh, decoration. You would get just and an very incredibly tiny, tiny portion. Yeah, no, like you know, proper portion, very Italian in the concept. So yeah, okay, antipasti, cool. primi, secondi. Sure. Very Italian in the sure. concept, but uh, at the same time of an incredible quality. Mm. And uh, you know, your particular philosophy about wine or your your taste in wine. At what point did you discover that that, and like and come to kind of seek out these particular wines that you like working with now well you know for me it was there it was in japan okay so as i said before i tried i tried out you know some of the best one in the world uh because i was working in a mission star restaurant that was mashing wines like that Mm. you know it was very normal to open that stuff Mm. Uh, well, particularly in the, Dublin, you know, there's some pretty big business going on there, yeah, a lot of international well, companies. And, and especially because uh, Ireland is not uh, a wine region, you know, they don't produce sure, wine. So the wine comes all from overseas, so you get a bit of everything, obviously, with a, with an incredibly uh, French focus. Sure. Uh, so when I started there, uh, there was probably two or three Italian wine in the list. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and when I left, there was 100, 100 but... Uh, it's different yeah <laughs> but yeah moving back to you know to 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 japan uh it's definitely there that i i tried some wine that really blow my mind in terms of flavor mm-hmm. and in that particular contest being in japan and uh, and going at least once a week with somebody from the restaurant eating japanese and understanding that culture uh in that particular contest uh with that particular attention to flavors, mm. uh, trying such a wines for me has been incredible. So that's where I tried for the first time uh, wines that I now currently import into Australia. Sure. You know, such a Cantino Giardino, for example, or uh, or Panevino. So and, they, uh, so these wines were already uh, were they fairly new to Japan or were they fairly established? Because I know obviously we we're talking. Um, uh, for those who don't know the kind of wines that Georgia works with in general, um, we're talking what uh, is generally referred to as natural wine. Um, and and Japan has a pretty good uh, market for natural wine. Uh, you know, it's, it's the biggest, it's the biggest in outside the world. Of, at, outside of like the Paris, for example. Um, Paris was nothing until a year ago, two mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and still, Japan is 
probably I had mm-hmm. for what I know from friends there and importers. Um, but yeah, um, every single wine that is in Australia now uh, has been in see, Japan. It's been in years, Japan yeah. for fifteen years. Sure, sure. Um, and 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 the the restaurant you were working with, did they have a particular interest in those kind of wines, or that was just sort of quite accidental? No, it wasn't accidental. That's the thing, you know. It's um, because that place was built around uh, quality and flavor. And also it was quite small. That was unavoidable. Sure. Yes. So the, the wine is by the glass was something like, uh, you know, the owner who was working in the floor would, you know, um, when there was a chance, he would open something. Mm-hmm depending on who was coming to it mm-hmm. and then that wine would have be sold by the glass to other people as well so there was not a list by the glass sure and um was definitely natural wine predominant um even if there was still um some wine that are more um established and old school but you know incredibly good for flavors so sure. The, the 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 attention there wasn't necessarily on natural and on non natural, it was on the flavor and uh, and and Japanese people are very good with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so umami, for example. Yeah, but the idea here is, you drink a wine uh, because it's interesting, because it's a refined flavor, because it's a flavor you haven't tried before. Sure. Uh, which is a very Japanese concept, but is also. Uh, um, what people that are eating and drinking a lot of are looking for, sure. you know, this curiosity, um, and and uh, and that's a, I approach my job in a very same way. I'm looking for things that taste uh, different, that they taste. They have a lot of sense of place, and uh, and they taste different because of that. So, what were your impressions of of the wine market when you first arrived to Australia? You you went straight to Sydney, I'm assuming. Yeah, I went straight to Sydney, um, and um, after my experience in Japan, I was like, uh, you know, that was about six and a half years ago, mm-hmm. and um, I said, you know, it would be here. I could, I could bring any of these ones here because there is nothing here already. Sure. So, so you could or you couldn't. You could because sure. there was like. A, but did you did you kind of think that there was the opportunity for that or? Well, I didn't really think there was an opportunity. I just thought uh, if, you know, these wines are fantastic, so obviously they need to be communicated, but uh, um, there is no reason why they couldn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it wasn't that wasn't the issue. Uh, I just saw this uh, as a great opportunity to bring stuff that wasn't here already. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I remember I started to import wine to, to the restaurant I was working for. Mm-hmm. And uh, which is Vini, and uh, I remember I did a big shipment, and uh, in that shipment there is probably half of the wines that are not now distributed over ten importers now. Okay, interesting. <laughs> so I organized so many samples. Uh, I brought stuff like you know, for example, the Ageno. You know, I brought sample of that and seeing people's reaction and you know it was definitely difficult Mm -hmm. but uh, after you know all these years even today um, it's always difficult to say uh, what is working or what is not gonna work or what people are gonna like or they what they're not gonna like sure Uh, so I don't really bother that much about this I just bother about I like it Mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, I explain to people why I like it. So communication and uh, and and sort of a background around what I give you it's extremely important because it's a journey. Sure. Uh, so this is the first thing, and uh, and secondly, um, people taste changes as well. So they may not like it one time, and they may ended up 
do you know really like it and smash it so, was it important for you the the context in which people were being introduced to these wines so for example you know you're with Vigny and then you know you established one to one bc the environment and and the food that you were offering to the people was that an important um way to to kind of t educate people or introduce people to this kind of wine this concept yeah well absolutely so again um the reason why I liked Vini and, you know, I love to work there for the first uh, couple of years in Australia was that uh, um, I, I found, that, you know, Andrew's way of cooking, um, again, extremely traditional, you know, so looking for good ingredients, sure. uh, shopping to the market rather than calling the supply on the phone. Yeah. Um, and... Um, working with simplicity uh, so not too many ingredients but good ingredients and um, um, at that time the, the, the wine list was uh, you know completely different you know only the big brand were present in Australia so, so when you say the big brands but, uh, the big Italian brands the big Italian brands yeah I'm, I'm talking about here you know what I'm um, what I was exposed to, which is Italian wines, sure, and how they particular Italian wine market is evolved, sure, sure, of course, and so, but obviously it's not just the Italian market that is evolved in that in this direction, but it's also the French market, it's also the Australian market. A few years ago, six and a half years ago, there there were not as many people, as many interesting people making interesting wine mm -hmm. in Australia like mm -hmm. they are now. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, it's not just uh, about uh, Italian. It's it's a it's something that happened to the whole markets. Um, did you very quickly kind of find what I would call kindred spirits in terms of people who are making wine locally or people who are um, selling wines, whether distributing, wholesaling, or you know sommeliers, that kind of thing. Did you very quickly establish very close connections? Connections, with people? not not really, no. So my first connection were with uh, with customers. So um, obviously, because I I'm I'm very passionate. Uh, I always had great relationship with all the regular customers. Yeah. And uh, so to the point that, you know, people would come to the restaurant, you know, and calling me by name and uh, asking me to pick a wine, asking me to pick the food and don't bother about anything, which is, you know, the best you can expect when you're doing this job. Sure. When you get to that point that uh, people are trusting you for something. Um, the connections I started to establish after, after, you know, a little bit of success that I had with uh, one to one bc So... Um, obviously I got many people from the industry coming over introducing themselves and uh, I, I did start to go somewhere else too and, uh, and then I, I created my connection mm -hmm. and that's that's when as well I started to distribute wines and uh, obviously by distributing wine going in different cities in different state, mm. you, you're gonna meet all all these people. Mm. It helps that you, know, you were in Sydney, where um, there was this kind of the the, the new um, wine bar uh, trend, and the people the people coming from all over Australia, I guess, or even internationally, are coming to Sydney, and so it's an it's an opportunity for them to come in and then be introduced to these kind of wines, and in the context of the food that you guys are serving. Um, where, where did you get the idea to open up a, a wine bar in Hong Kong? Because um, there, there's a one two one BC in Hong Kong, is it? Yes, not? there is. Yeah, so um, that was uh, an opportunity that um, Andrew explored, and um, so I, I remember that uh, um, this sort of idea came up, and uh, we we were traveling to to one of the wine fairs in Italy and we stopped in Hong Kong for a couple of days mm. uh, uh, looking for locations and um, we spent like two days looking for a lot of places uh, that were on the market and then just an hour be before flying out we saw a place that you know was looking really good in a very groovy place and mm. uh, and, um, and and ended up to you know be for um, uh, available to lease so 
um, that was uh, the beginning of uh, May and um, the restaurant the wine bar opened in uh, at the end of August so it was a very quick process wow okay <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> because, Hong, Kong. because Hong Kong obviously is uh, a very important wine market it's possibly one of the most important wine markets in Asia now there's a lot of big business going on um, but certainly in terms of as a gateway into China um, it's a very much a Bordeaux or I guess a, a French wine market. The yeah. idea of um, not only having a, a wine bar dedicated to Italian wine, but to particularly the, that kind of Italian wine is, is such a, an amazing uh, thing to be doing in Hong Kong. I, I, I can't, I, yeah, I can only imagine kind of what people were first being, uh, how they were reacting to this kind of concept and these kind of wines. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you have to think that um, you know after after one to one BC in Sydney. Um, for me, doesn't matter where we're doing something. Uh, this is the way I go. Mm -hmm. So as long as the concept and the philosophy <laughs> is strong. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as I said before, when I came to Australia, I wasn't really worried about working or not working. Uh, I was thinking that um, it's, it's, it, it works. It happens everywhere mm -hmm. uh, in the world. If you if you went to Paris four or five years ago, it would be a completely different scene. Mm. And now, very quickly, it's changed. Um, you go to north of Europe, and uh, you 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 barely find uh, uh, most of the most most of the interesting places only serve natural wine now. Yeah, obviously, uh, the, the, so it's the, happening. The, the number one restaurant in yeah, the world, exactly. for example. Yeah. Only, so it's, uh, you know, that, that you like it or not, uh, people that are looking for quality and for, f for flavor, they cannot avoid the natural wine and that's the same for me. So I got exposed to that and uh, I can't go back um, because uh, I, I feel that uh, that's the way to go. Mm. So it doesn't matter where, you know, even if, even if it was in Alaska, it would it be natural wine? Mm. I think for me, one of the big important things is that it's people want to know what they're putting into their body in the same way that we care about where our food is coming from, knowing how wine is made and, and, and what's being put into it or taken away from it, I think is important, um, from, you know, basically from, from also from a health point of view, but also from, I think from, from a, you know, an ethical point of view as well, sort of know that like, things are being made with with care and attention and and you know there's there's they're not hiding anything as well yeah absolutely for me it's it's uh, it's it's very much about that so it's about uh, relationships or so working with people that i like and mm -hmm. supporting people that i like supporting people that are uh, preserving tradition in a way even even where they're very experimental they preserve in their land uh, and by doing that they they assure a future to their land sure and um, obviously is something that, uh, um, again, is, is very little processed. Uh, so um, I can, I can feel, I feel comfortable to say that um, a glass or two of wine with your meal is actually good for you. Sure. Uh, despite for the alcohol, I don't think, uh, I think uh, um, you can see uh, good wines um, as a alcohol. This is not what it's about for mm, me. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing. But the other thing I believe is that uh, you can change the market by doing what you're doing. Mm. And um, and an example is uh, you know the festival that is being held in Sydney, Rostock Sydney. So obviously you're one of the big people behind the Rootstock Festival, which just had its second year and it's going to be having its third year next year. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, that's, uh, that's changing every, everybody's mind. So is is having more producers thinking and wondering why this type of one are working. Mm. Uh, so you have producers that are more genuine and they really believe in what they do and, and you have other producers that are saying well you know uh, 
uh, now is uh, is actually on a marketing point of view is interesting. So doesn't matter in which way you approach it. For me, it's important that uh, people start to be aware about uh, you can make wine without additions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I it's I care about. It. It's mm. not about uh, um, initially anyway. Uh, it's. Uh, you know the philosophy of the approach is important but uh, you know even if initially you're you're driven by marketing reason i i don't care as long as you you know you get into it and then you sure. you'll understand sure. um so we we are planning to do uh we're stuck in hong kong and that will change the game too so right. so the idea is uh um is to 2015 rustock cine in rustock hong kong wow Fantastic. And you know, of course, there's been a couple of other little events being run in, in Melbourne, you know, a few months ago, Handmade. You were just over in, C um, in Adelaide for, uh, for a little tasting as well. So obviously, like even in, in different areas, just in Australia, there seems to be a lot more interest. And it's really exciting to see people sort of talking about it. I guess, you know, there's debate about it. Um, you know, some people disagree, some people um, I guess there are people on, on, on both sides of, of the argument, but it's, it's an opportunity to discuss and kind of challenge what, what our conceptions are, I guess. And so, uh, for me, it's, a, it's an exciting time, um, in, in the wine market, not just in Australia, but also in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and people can find the wines you work with, obviously in Sydney, definitely going to Vinnie in 121BC, but you'll see them in, in a lot of the, uh, the, the top wine bars and some shops as well. Same thing um, uh, in, in, in places like Melbourne and Adelaide, um, you, you'll be able to find some of your wines. But wh wh what's the best way for people to find out some of the wineries you represent? Uh, well, your website? working on the website. No. Working on the website? Yeah, after, finally. <laughs> <laughs> you prefer to go out and Finally. talk to people in person, don't you? Yeah, but you know, if uh, that's yes, but uh, in the other hand, um, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm realizing, and it's not that I didn't realize it before, it's just that uh, w uh, building a proper website with uh, proper information mm -hmm. um, and uh, obviously done with your touch, mm. uh, so make it very personal. Uh, it's uh, it's extremely time consuming, uh, but it's essential. So um, it's now you know by 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 the end of October we will be up and running mm. uh, with uh, with the website for uh, one to one BC and for the import as well, in which you can find all the information about the wines. Uh, in the meantime, definitely. Important. In the meantime, definitely, I would suggest people to shout out to um, to Joel and Ned. Go to the, Drinks D R N K S. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and you can actually buy stuff. I think now they're shipping to Melbourne for for free. Yeah, which is wow. fantastic. So so there's some um, obviously they'll find some of your wines on there. Yeah. Uh, and and really good prices I think as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you are on Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, I mean Twitter. I mean Instagram. Uh, um, not much Facebook, but uh, I will work on that too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but put just make sure you put in Giorgio de, de Maria or your one to one BC Vinny. I'm sure you'll find him in in some aspect. But um, Giorgio, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, uh, guys. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Intrepid Wino uh, or the podcast at the Vincast. I've actually jumped back into my Instagram account. Um, same thing at Intrepid Wino. Uh, please do visit the website intrepidwino.com. Uh, do subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher uh, and leave a rating and review when you got up an opportunity. That would be fantastic. I've had some lovely comments so far and would love to hear more. But until next time, bye.